Hello, everybody. I'd like to welcome you here to the Day in the Life of the River program. Today, we're on the banks of the Connecticut River at the Bayard Cutting Off Freedom in Great River, New York. And this program usually has a class of students out collecting data. But as a result of the pandemic that's sweeping the country, schools are not allowing students to go out on field trips. So instead, we decided as a group of experts here and, and creators of the program that we would do this ourselves. We didn't want to lose any data. So we're, we're at the mouth of the Connecticut River, and we'll be going through all of the activities that the students would go through, sending that data to the teacher in the classroom, and students can then analyze the data for themselves. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce the other members of our team. So my name is Mel Morris. I work at Brookhaven National Laboratory. I'm one of the co-creators of the Day in the Life of the River program. Hi, I'm Melissa Perrott with the Central Pine Barrens Commission and one of the co-creators of this fabulous program. Ron Gallardi with the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. Hello, everybody. My name is Alida Perez from Brookhaven National Lab. Welcome. Okay, now we're doing group one and we're going to look at the tide and see how it moves. Is it rising or is it falling? And how we're going to measure that is through our flagging. When we first got here, we put a flag in and then every 10 minutes we add another flag for a total of 30 minutes, which we'll come back and we'll show you how far the tide has fallen or risen and which direction it's going. And the cool thing about the tide is it's uh, based on the moon and the gravitational pull. So it's pretty cool and you can maybe study that too to learn a little bit more. All right, so we're back after that 30 minute mark to determine our tide. And the tide is something we haven't seen yet um, in the six, seven weeks we've been doing this because it's all over the place. It's not giving us a clear reading. And we've determined it's probably the variable with the wind being pushed, pushing the water up against the shore. So we don't have, um, may not have the best accurate data for our tide, but we're going to measure it anyway. And I have my uh, Mr. Ron Gilardi here to help me. So it was, this is the first one. Okay. And this was and the, the second. second one. So that was rising and that's four centimeters. Okay. And then it went this one, that one. That one to where? This one to this one. Okay. And that fell 10 centimeters. And then this one, this to this one, one, this one, yeah. It's about a third of a centimeter. <laughs> well, so four millimeters. All right, so we're going to give you that data, but do keep in mind that it's a pretty windy day out today and that probably is determining the tide difference. The, what we're going to measure here is going to be the current direction and speed. The way we're going to do that is to see a floating object and time how far it moves in 60 seconds. From that, we can calculate uh, centimeters or meters per minute and then we could even do miles per hour or knots, which is a measurement of speed on water. To do this, we're going to have a brightly colored object and it's very floatable. We have a small orange, we're gonna throw this in. Orange is great because it's visible, it floats nicely, and it's biodegradable so we don't have to retrieve it. So we're gonna throw this in, we're gonna time it for 60 seconds, measure the linear distance along the waterfront, and then we'll be able to calculate current and speed. What I'd like to share with you now is some of the weather data that we can see today. We uh, just measured the water temperature with a thermometer at 13 degrees Celsius. Uh, we will do that every half hour to see if there's any change in water temperature as the day progresses, the current changes, we'll see. The air temperature is six degrees Celsius, so there's a little bit of a difference between the two, and that will do every hour that we're present. The cloud cover, or, or how overcast the sky is, is just done visually. We imagine the sky divided into four quadrants with a sort of point directly overhead. 
And we can see that the cloud is, uh, in each of these quadrants, is about 50% clouds and 50% blue sky. So just generalizing, is it 50 or above or is it 50 or less? I'd say it's just a little bit on the other side of 50 plus. So I'm going to call this 50 to 75% cloud cover. Sun shining through, but there's still plenty of uh, cover. The wind, which we'll measure precisely in a moment, is a little bit mixed. It's changing direction. If we look in the distance, there's an American flag on a flagpole, nice and high, and that's giving us an idea of both the speed of the wind as well as the direction of the wind. So the flag is telling me the wind is coming out of this direction and blowing in this direction. Another way we can tell is by feeling the wind ourselves. And to make yourself a better weather vane or wind vane, if you moisten your cheeks, you can actually feel the wind on your face. Your nose kind of divides the wind across your face and it, you can feel a little better. But because we're under some trees, I think it's a little mixed because it feels to me like it's coming more from this direction, which would be different from what the flag is telling us. So we'll figure it out as we go. One of the things you're able to determine from the area visually is what's called the Beaufort scale. This was created in the 19th century by a British rear admiral. Uh, his last name was Beaufort. And he used visual clues, including ripples on water, white caps on waves, and flags to determine the wind speed, to estimate the range of wind. So if we look over the Connecticut River right now, it's definitely not calm or still. There's ripples on the water, but there's no heavy white caps. It's bound as a river. It doesn't have um, as much as a bay might have, but we have ripples less than white caps. So we're going to call this rippled. So there are many ways to measure the speed of wind, and the common instrument to use is called an anemometer. And there are several types of anemometer. This is a digital anemometer. It has a, a fan blade in here that spins as the wind goes through it. The faster it spins, the higher the wind speed. And then we have a digital readout here that can tell us in whatever units we're interested in what the actual speed is. So what we do is we hold this into the direction of the wind and we look at the digital readout. And so the wind is variable. This, there was just a gust of 10.7 miles an hour. Now it's 12.9, 14.5, then back down to 6. So it's a variable speed with gusts up to as high as 14 miles an hour. So now we'll begin group two. We're going to start with the site description of our location. We're at the shore of the Connecticut River at the Bayard Cutting Arboretum. And so one of the things that we're noticing is that there are a lot of non-native trees planted on purpose by the Arboretum that's sort of a characteristic of this site. In addition, we have the artificial bulkhead running the entire shoreline here. Uh, there's some breaks in it in other locations, but for the most part, there's this thick wooden barrier. It's designed to help secure the shore from erosion, and it does a great job with that, but it also doesn't allow the water to flow up and down on the shoreline like you would see at a beach. So uh, using the characteristics uh, checklist, um, the, the shoreline itself is artificially bulkheaded, and above it we have grass and vegetation. Uh, it's nice and flat, and then we have the drop-off when we reach the water. Uh, there's no garbage, no pier, no road ending, a uh, nice path behind us, but it's part of the Arboretum, so it's a walking path. The water itself has no vegetation on the surface, nor does it have any vegetation below the surface. I splashed around a little bit in my big rubber pants, and um, it's really just mud and sand on the bottom, which we'll see when we take a core sample as well, I suspect. I am predicting. So that's the site description that we've got. So the next for group two is the sketch of a site map. Now clearly we are not going to sketch that for you, but we're going to give you everything um, that you can do that. We're providing you the Latin long, so you could put that in Google Earth 
or Google Maps and you'll be able to get a really good idea visually of our site as well as using this video to look and the description from Ron uh, looking around so you could create a map of our site. So those artists in the room, please take this on. So the next thing we're going to uh, determine is the sediment characteristics of the river bottom at this location. I have this tool, which is uh, sort of a digger. It's got a serrated bottom, little teeth here. It's not very sharp, but it should work through the sediment. And then this sort of open uh, slot that will be able to remove the sediment. So I'm gonna drive this down into the sediment. I have a mallet in case I reach any resistance. And then I'll show you what it looks like in here. We'll measure the total length of the sample and then determine if we have any anoxic sediment. Uh, anoxic is based on oxygen, so uh, the area near the surface is usually well oxygenated. It'll be a nice sandy color or maybe a little bit muddy. And then if we see anoxic sediment, it'll be darker because bacteria that lives without um, the oxygen available has a different form of respiration and produces hydrogen sulfide instead of carbon dioxide as a byproduct. And that hydrogen sulfide is the marsh smell that you might be familiar with, that, that stinky kind of rotten egg smell uh, in a marsh. That's the hydrogen sulfide from the bacteria. And it's an indication of how well oxygenated the water is and the amount of current that allows the water to flow. So let's see how we do here. You're not going to be able to see it unless you come a little closer. Oh, this is very soft. No mallet necessary. Okay, you have the ruler? So the sediment is less muddy than I thought it would be. There's some mud incorporated in it, but it's mostly sand, uh, maybe some small, small rocks. Again, using the metric scale, because there's sediment all the way down to the bottom of the teeth. Oh, that's standard. Get the metric at zero. Uh, we come out to 17 and a half centimeters of our sediment core. And there looks like there's a little block of uh, material there. It's a little darker, but beneath it looks just as oxygenated as above it. So I'm gonna say we don't have an anoxic layer. So the entire thing is oxygenated. Let's now sort of sprit. Oh, thank you. Let me get me out of the way here. Satisfactory? Okay. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna look through it and see what the characteristics of the sediment are. So I'll spread this out. Get some water in it. So it's a little bit of mud, but abundant amounts of sand. There is that's a little clump of mud, that's all that was. I was hoping it was a worm or something, but it's, it's not alive. Very, very, very small stones. Uh, this probably the biggest one is right there. So uh, sand with a little bit of mud and some gravel. So now we're going to do the aquatic biology survey by pulling a seine net through the water. This net here has floats at the top of the net. There are lead weights along the bottom. The bottom's the lead line, this is the float line. Uh, we'll unroll this, I think this one is 20 foot long. We'll pull it up current into the, the, uh, into the current upstream in the Kinequat, and then uh, we will lift it out of the water over the bulkhead and see if we've caught any organisms. Wish us luck.
So we, uh, so far, have identified four different species of organisms in that short uh, seine that we pulled up. Uh, they're unfortunately very similar in size, so it's going to be difficult for us to do the count, but we're going to do that for you, and it'll appear on the data sheet. So the four species we have we're going to measure, again, as always, using the metric scale. I'm going to just sort of suspend the ruler over the water, and we'll go through what we caught. So this first one here, uh, stocky body, um, kind of a thick body as well. This is the sheep's head minnow. I'm going to use my 10 as my zero, just so I'm in the middle here. It comes out to 3.4 centimeters is the very tip of the tail there. Sheep's head minnow. This one, they don't, they're not very hardy. These probably are going to have some mortality from this catch, unfortunately. This, believe it or not, is an anchovy. This is the bay anchovy. Uh, pretty common in estuaries. And it is 5.1 centimeters. Uh, you can tell the bay anchovy a little bit different from the silver side. The stripe does go down the side, but the mouth on a bay anchovy is on the bottom of the head. Let me get the silver side and I'll show you what it looks like. Where the silver side has the mouth in the water. On the top of its head, and it's a little bit different of a feeding strategy. The bay anchovy feeds as it moves through the water, uh, where the silver side will feed on the surface. Okay, so let's get a measurement for the silver side. I don't know if this is an Atlantic silver side. It might be, uh, but I'll try to key it out later. This is 4.2 centimeters, and that's the typical size from what we caught. And our final organism is this unhappy little fellow. This is the blue crab, or blue claw crab. There's a couple of ways that we can tell. Blue crabs have a spine at the end of their carapace on both sides and nine little points between their eye stalk and that long spike, the long one being the ninth. Second, they typically have red to blue markings on their claws itself but probably most indicated, the best indicator, I'm going to turn it around, are these back legs, which have swimmerettes, and that allows them to swim through the water column. This is a young of the year. This one hatched this year. Uh, it has a lot of growing to do. It'll shed its exoskeleton and continue to grow as it goes. We're going to do a carapace width from point to point for this one, uh, mostly because the legs can spread or be contracted, and legs aren't really a good way to measure and it's 3.9 centimeters from tip to tip. Section. So the next section is the Habitat Association Survey. And this is my favorite part. Every week we're out here, I immediately start looking for animals that we can identify and list them um, for our, our site. And this is an area where I think every year we could do better at because we do really good at the aquatic biodiversity when you do the same. But the animals and plants that are on land and in the sky are equally as important to describing your site. So today's a different day as well from others we've had. It's super windy and it's super cold. So the minute we got here, I started looking for mammals. We've seen none. And the birds, it's very, very uh, slim pickings out here today. We've seen four ring-billed gulls. We've seen four cormorants. We saw, it was a starling or a grackle, but I will say it was a grackle because it was a little bigger than what I think a starling would be. And we've heard some songbirds and we were able to identify a chickadee. So uh, we'll keep looking and we will um, be writing down everything we see um, for you so you can get a better understanding of our site. So another part of our Habitat Association survey, um, oh, it's moving, this is so cool. So this is a bumblebee, and what's special about this is the weather. This is probably the last week that we're going to have uh, the bumblebees um, and other types of hymenoptera out because their food source, right, is um, depleting and also it's getting too cold for them to survive. So this guy probably doesn't have much longer, but she's making it um, the best she can. She's hunkered down here on a flower and she's a little bit stunned as well because she's been there all morning and she hasn't had a lot of movement, but it's pretty cool to see her. And uh, we also saw a, gr a great blue heron. 
uh, that was beautiful and majestic. And ospreys are very, very popular here, but not right now. They've already uh, flown south for the winter, so we haven't seen any yet. Uh, bald eagles have been known to be uh, here, and we're keeping an uh, eye open for them, and we'll certainly come back to you if we see one. Thanks. Now we're going to take a look at the flora component of the Habitat Association Survey. And you'll see four main species that we were able to identify. And here you could see the Phragmite, which is a non-native invasive, and also Ron's, Ron standing next to the Grounds Hillbush, which is a native species here to Long Island in the Northeast. And then next we have the seaside goldenrod. And we've seen the seaside goldenrod in most uh, locations we've been to. It's very specific to um, salt marsh areas. Um, again, this is a native species to Long Island. And then one of the most interesting finds is this cypress tree. It is called a bald cypress. And you could see the knees that are coming up from the soil, which are there to aerate the uh, roots and also to stabilize the tree because it is known to be in um, salt marsh areas and swampy areas. So hello everybody. So now we are doing group four, which is the chemistry. And we would like to look at the health of the chemical health of the, of the Kennequat uh, River today. So we took samples from three different areas along the river side. And just want to let's show you what we found. Let's just look at the soft oxygen first. Okay. So this is the soft oxygen right here. And and it's very windy today, which is very cool. And as you notice from the three sides that we, we, we had, actually we noticed a difference in the three sides that we, we actually uh, looked at it, where one of the sides basically being zero, a zero dissolved oxygen, as compared to perhaps uh, four ppm for the other two sides. Um, it could be possible that there was, uh, it was repeated twice. It probably could be done to the wind that we have, or other, oh, it could be uh, due to the, where the area that I collected the sample from. Now we're going to look at the pH of the water. So tell us whether how acidic or how basic the water is. Uh, these are the two uh, tests that we did from two sites. I'm just going to show you uh, uh, the, sample the testing for the third site. So for this, we take about 10 milliliters of water. The nice thing about the nice thing about these tubes is that there's a line that marks where the 10 milliliter water mark is. So we are going to add water from the third site along the Kennequa. And we're almost getting there. All right, almost, we want to make sure the meniscus, the lower side of the meniscus, very good. Okay, I'm just going to put it right here because we're having a very windy day today, which is cool. And then I'm going to add one tablet of the range tablet. I want to make sure that I don't touch it with my hands, because my hands are, my skin oils and so forth may interfere. And we're just going to drop it right there and I'm going to cap it and the pH test is a very quick a quick quick read read so we're just going to mix it by inversion and not surprising our water uh, pH of our water has been very consistent among the three different sites uh, basically what we're seeing is a slightly acidic water very close to perhaps pH 6 or 6.5 among all there we go among the site that we have seen so far very consistent reading two sets of chemical testing that we did was for phosphate and for nitrate uh, phosphate is a nutrient that is required by plants and animals to growth and nitrates are a, a nitrate is a necessary um, uh, chemical that for protein building. So the levels of nitrate, depending what we, they are, it can tell us a little bit about 
whether there's overgrown of plants in the river or whether there's a high number of bacteria in the river, okay? Right. And so if the levels of these nitrates are, of, ph of phosphates are high enough, it will affect or will have an impact in the amount of oxygen that we can see because then the, what will happen is that they will decrease the levels of dissolved oxygen. So let's look at our, 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 our data. It has been pretty consistent about the three different sites and our level of phosphate is about a one ppm or one part per million that has been pretty consistent among the three different sites and the level of nit nitrate you notice that i in order to for us to do the nitrate test we have to put it into an aluminum bag or a cover it and the reason we do that is because uv light that comes from the sun can damage or can um, break down the chemical reaction uh, that happens uh, to the detection of nitrate can affect that Again, the level of nitrate that we have been seeing so far is pretty consistent, about five, five parts per million in all the three different sites that we tested. So it's a relatively healthy river. Um, the levels of nitrate and phosphate are not overwhelmingly high on the lower range. And we have seen uh, an, a comparable amount of dissolved oxygen uh, across. So the next characteristic of the water that we're going to measure is part of group four chemical analysis and that's called salinity. Salinity is a measure of the dissolved salts that are in the water. Certainly fresh water has low salinity, ocean water has high salinity, and to measure this we, we can do it two different ways. One of the ways is to use an instrument called the refractometer. Refractometer is a tube that has a glass plate on the bottom. And what we do is, uh, sorry about that. What we do is we put the sample to be tested on this glass plate. So first thing I want to do is clean this off with some fresh water to be sure that the scale is right. And I say, I look through this eyepiece and I'll see a blue scale and essentially it's all blue, which means that there's zero salinity here. I'm going to take some of this with our dropper. Just put a drop on the scale. Close the cover. Look into the light. And what I see is a number three, so that would be three parts per thousand for salinity. Now that's very low, but the reason it's low is also we're at the mouth of the river and the tide is, is just finished going out. So there's more fresh water than salt water coming in. Another way we can measure salinity is to use a home, is to use a home aquarium salinity me measure. This works based on specific gravity. Salt water is, more salt means the specific gravity is higher, less salt means it's lower. So this, we can just look at this and see that it's, let's see. This is barely reading, which means that it's mostly fresh water. And if I look at the scale to get a reading, I get 1.4 parts per thousand. So it's, it agrees with the refractometer pretty well. And the, and the salinity does determine the kinds of organisms that can live there. Some, some organisms can stand high salt content, some low salt content, and then estuarian animals are really hardy and they can sit, stand both low and salt content. Turbidity is the measurement of how cloudy the water is. Basically how much of the, the um, the suspended particles, whether they're alive or uh, abiotic, are floating in the water and making it cloudier. To do this, there are a couple of different methods. We are going to use what's called the short sight tube. This is the container that the water quality kit comes in, and there's a tiny little Secchi disc sticker in the bottom. 
what we're going to do is fill this to the fill line and then compare visually to this sort of grayed out scale. It looks like it's just sort of fading, but that's supposed to be an indicator of the, uh, the units, the JTUs are the, the sort of units that are used to estimate how many particles are in the water. So let me get to a spot where I haven't muddied this up. Pour out water until we reach the fill line, which is right there. A little more. That's about good. And then looking down, obviously I can still see the Secchi disc, but it is not stark black, certainly not gray. I would compare it to the center one maybe a little bit less than that. So uh, up to 40 JTUs, short sight tube. So we wanna thank you for allowing us to be you this year. Uh, this year has been challenging and unfortunately, we couldn't get the students out on the river, but instead we uh, were able to do it. And let me tell you something, we had so much fun. This is our last week. We've been doing this every week for the last six weeks and it's been, um, really educational uh, and we really could see all that great work that you are doing over the years. I want to give a shout out. We do have uh, Mr. Halloran from Connectquat High School is also out today um, taking data just by himself so his students can continue to compare that data. We're here collecting data for you to use in your classroom. Uh, we didn't fill in all of the formulas. We left some for you, Celsius, the Fahrenheit, the Beaufort scale, and some other equations that allow you to really feel hands-on. So thank you for having um, us be part of this. Thanks for joining us every year and doing such great work. Um, and next year we'll see you hopefully in person. Thank you.